Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 445. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm George Conger. Today is October 10th, 2018. George, welcome to the... George, you still have electricity? I, I'm just reading Drudge here. Uh, I don't know if you've looked outside yet, but you're getting hit by the worst hurricane in at least a generation. Category 4, it's hitting the panhandle. Uh, you must have some really good underground uh, utilities over there. We are at the eastern edge of this hurricane. It's As we speak right now, the storm is actually due west of where we are, heading north at about 10 to 12 miles per hour, and it's going to hit the panhandle around Panama City. So we are not going. To, we are getting mild gusts of winds, 20, 25 miles per hour, and bands of showers circling through. So we're going to be okay. Uh, but down on the coast, I'm about 10 miles from the ocean itself, and I have a number of parishioners who live along the ocean. They're going to get uh, six to eight feet, it's estimated, of tidal surge, which is going to knock down some houses, going to flood, uh, destroy property. And, but that's nothing as compared to what's going to happen in Panama City uh, and the, the northern, northern panhandle if all the press reports are true and we get this storm hitting. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. And I see all these reports all the time. A reporter will go up to knock on a door of a trailer. Haven't you guys heard? Aren't you guys going to evacuate? And, you know, there's Bubba. I'm not going to evacuate. You were here two weeks ago knocking at my door, and you told me this is going to be a big storm, or two years ago, and it never occurred. Well, I yesterday I spent the day sandbagging a storage unit I have uh, near that's close to the... My church and my home are about 100 and 150 feet above sea level. We live on the ridge in Florida. We're actually the highest church in Florida, and we're not even Anglo-Catholics. No. We're drug addicts. Uh, <laughs> But we're on a ridge, but the uh, storage unit is about 10 feet above sea level. And I have a number of parishioners who live in mobile homes on the ocean in, that are two feet above sea level. And, you know, the county has given a mandatory evacuation notice for an area west of the major north-south highway. And nobody that I'm aware of in our congregation has left. And they are... and. They say, well, you know, I can't take my dog with me. Uh, I don't mm -hmm. want to go to a public shelter. But again and again and again, it said, well, you know, remember Anderson Cooper last month standing in a ditch in the Carolinas, and then the camera pans back and you see the film crew standing on dry land, and he's basically making up this exciting noise about sure. uh, the hurricane. It's the end yeah. of the earth. People... Older, well, I'll say those older parishioners of mine who will not evacuate, a large part of that is they don't trust the media. Okay. Uh, in other words, it's it's not, it's they look at this as being, yeah, you fooled me how many times? I'm not going to fool it again. Yeah, I mean, it, it is a hysteria, and we're seeing that more and more in the press, uh, left and right, where everything is. Uh, completely black or completely white in discussing issues. And when people run out of things to talk about, uh, a little violence is breaking out, and it's a, a little disconcerting. Uh, they saw Hillary Clinton uh, in a, a slow little interview she did last night almost call for it's time for a civil war. Uh, that You just can't deal with Republicans. They're evil. Uh, we're just going to have to fight harder. And I'm like, yeah, how much harder do you want to fight? You know, at this point, the, the next step beyond discussion is violence. Are, are we okay. ready for that again? Or have we slipped ourselves into a little uh, pre-Civil War going on here? And, and really, after all this time of trying to uh, de-arm yourselves and tell us how bad guns are, you want to have a civil war with the most armed uh, pro-gun people, uh, you know, ever? I don't know. Uh, does it Kevin, understand? Kevin, I got to tell you, yeah. we're watching the Kavanaugh hearings, watching the uh, antics of the Antifa groups up in uh, the Northwest. Sure. This is all stuff that I saw in the Episcopal Church over the past 20, 30 years. All oh, the general. The yeah, absolutely. Sure. The same sort of uh, anger. Uh, I, 
when I was in seminary, I uh, was sponsored from the Diocese of Pennsylvania, which is the city of Philadelphia in the five counties area. And uh, we, as seminarians, we had to come home for diocesan convention. And I, and I was sponsored by a man named Dan Sullivan, who was the rector of the Church of the Good Samaritan, Paoli, PA. And Dan was a saintly man. And I use the term uh, with all sincerity. He was a saint of a man, one of the finest priests I ever knew. And the Diocese of Pennsylvania started to grapple with the homosexuality issue. And Dan got up and said he couldn't agree with some of the proposals being put forward because it contradicted scripture. And he cited a passage from Romans and saying, and as he was speaking, a, uh, an activist from one of the uh, Center City churches got up, walked over to him and spat in his face as he's standing before convention. And he shouted, I have AIDS and I hope you get it too. Now, in 1992, this is the start of the big AIDS hysteria. We don't sure. know where it comes from. You can get it for shaking hands. And that, I mean, the bishop didn't chastise the man who spat, uh, anything like that. That has sort of, in my, gosh, it's almost 30, it's, is it 30 years? It's almost 30 years. That is the tone uh, of... Uh, that tone that I saw in the Episcopal Church, I see now on the steps of the U.S. Supreme Court building. Sure. Oh, that was and, so, that was so bad. Uh, and you, I have to ask myself. Well, first I have to ask myself: Don't these people have jobs? Uh, yes. But second, it was their job to be protesters? What do you mean, George? But, 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 but second of all, um, to go through life with such bile, such anger, such hatred, um, it's just not. It's not right, and it's not healthy for your soul. No, it's... It, something has to happen. Sadly, something's going to happen. Sadly, it will probably be some limited form of violence before uh, people say, okay, all right, all right, you know, we understand. Time to back up. We'll have more civil conversations. But, you know, until then, somebody's going to die, George. And I don't know if it's going to be a Supreme Court person's going to be assassinated or... Uh, something like that, but we are to the edge of a fray where there's th we can't turn back from where we are. Something more violent is going to have to happen before we can turn back. I watched a little news clip last night uh, where the wife of a U.S. senator, uh, Mrs. Paul, the wife of Rand sure, Paul, Rand Paul, sure, uh, his wife's name escapes me. She told the interviewer how you know her husband has already been assaulted twice uh, in politically motivated assaults. His ribs were broken, and at one time. And uh, she now sleeps with a pistol under her pillow because she is afraid that some is going, that some nut is going to try to break into their house and kill them. This is the wife of a U.S. senator, for goodness sakes, talking like she is a, uh, like this is Rhodesia in 1979, and uh, the communist guerrillas are going to try to break in and murder them in their beds. And this is a U.S. senator's wife, and she wasn't doing this for political effect she was just stating matter of fact the facts yep this is the this is the fact now the kavanaugh is going to have fallout for a long time but some of the fallout i've seen is i'm watching college students and they're being interviewed by pro you know uh anti-kavanaugh people who you know supporters the cnn's the nbc's the msnbc's you know to get their take and these college students don't know what they're even there for they don't know what they're protesting they don't know why kavanaugh is bad and why he's evil what he did they're just there because it's the thing to do and they're being interviewed by msnbc hoping to get a great quote and i tell you what college students aren't giving very good quotes nowadays george oh kevin i really have a great deal of pity for their parents because you just took your son on a college visit this past weekend oh, yes and how much is it going to cost you to send ben off to university for a year everything i ever earned no uh it's it's amazing how expensive it is we took him to messiah uh <laughs> well he's going to be an engineer so he's going to get something in return <laughs> he'll you'll earn it back uh it, it's interesting because we, we went out to Messiah. It's about a farmer drive from here. Uh, we sat through the whole day of, you know, uh, what Messiah is all about. And I got a chance to talk to the chaplain uh, after one of these little seminar things. And I said, what is your average 18-year-old, uh, 17, 18, 19-year-old uh, like now who comes in here? And he goes, the first thing is, no matter where they come from, no matter what, 
uh, whether they're coming from Central Africa in a mission where their uh, parents are missionaries or, or whether they're uh, preacher's kids or whether they were brought up in the, in the church, they are Bible illiterate. They cannot read. They can't sit down and have comprehension. They can't open a book and be consumed by the book. Uh, they can read online. They're great with uh, uh, social interaction, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. So they have all a degree of thumb dexterity that yes. you and I have never, ever, never They're, have. They have incredible thumb dexterity. But your average kid, even the ones we're looking for, are completely Bible illiterate. They don't get the whole concept behind uh, creation and salvation and uh, their purpose in this world. So that they come here arriving not knowing who they are and what God wants for them. That's the, and, the first thing. Oh, well, let me finish up here. And hold on. <laughs> he goes, most are sexually confused. They don't know anything about their sexuality. Um, no matter how they were brought up, uh, they come in here gender confused, sexually confused uh, because of the age. Not because they had bad parents. Not because uh, you know, of any of these other influence other than society. And, you know, so our first job is to get them Bible literate, to let them know exactly why Christ came, what Christians are, what they do, and try and help them learn about themselves. And that, he goes, that's just year one. <laughs> let me tell you about year two. I'm like, George, this is going to be so bad. <sighs> I, have a, a, I have a really great congregation. I'm mm -hmm. very, very lucky. Good people, Christian people, Bible-believing people. And yet, and I, and last weekend I preached on divorce, and the weekend before that I preached on hell. Uh, so they're not getting the regurgitated New York Times op-ed. Sure, yeah. Yet, yet I am dealing with four women in my congregation, older women in their 70s and 80s, who lived with another man, who lived with a man, they were not married, I mean they were widowed or what have you, right. and for various reasons they didn't marry, and all four of these women, their male partners died, and the children of the male partner have sold the house out from underneath them, and they are essentially destitute because they were they were not married, they had no civil or legal protections, even though, and I know all four men who died, even though all four of them made it quite clear they wanted to take care of their partners. So wh why am I saying this, Kevin? The moral, uh, is it a vacuum? Is it in a lack? Uh, the moral, the moral crot, the moral cr the creep against morality, isn't just kids. I'm oh. seeing it in the in the hardcore constituency of faithful Episcopalians and Anglicans in their 70s and 80s. Um, people who a generation ago the thought that they would live with another person whom they were not married to wouldn't occur to them. I mean, if it's wrong. So, I mean, in my congregation, we don't have a gay issue. We have a living in <laughs> sin issue. And I, I don't want to sound like an old fogey, but, you know, that just is replicated across that sexual confusion you talked about young people. That sexual confusion takes place for older people as well. Oh, absolutely. It's true. In a different form, yeah. but still it's there. Yeah. It's, it's so hard because, you know, I've been fighting this battle since the 80s. I thought, you know, in certain places we're going to make, you know, obviously, uh, it'll be a challenge, but you're going to make some headway because it makes so much sense. Uh, science, reason, anthropology, history, uh, religion are all on the side of those who argue for solid married relationships, for, you know, working for a future together where, oops, somebody dies and you're not stuck in this legal limbo. Uh, oops, somebody dies and you're not uh, stuck with uh, kids that don't belong to you. And uh, oops, somebody dies and the, the great-grandparents aren't watching the babies. Uh, it's, it's so hard to, to watch this happen, but uh, guess what? We're called not to be anxious. We're called to do our duty as Christians regardless of the times regardless of the situation we find ourselves in. If we find ourselves slaves, we're supposed to be the best slaves we can be. If we find ourselves masters, we're supposed to be the best masters we can be. And uh, we can complain and, 
and uh, not like it, but guess what? That's not the call. Well, Kevin, is this Justin Welby's fault? <laughs> <laughs> Now, some of some of our viewers have uh, complained that we seem to find the dark hands of Justin Welby behind every social issue. And folks, we can tell you that this is not Justin Welby. This is not Justin Welby. It's Casper Jeffrey. Sure, it's not Justin Welby's. Justin Welby is off the hook on this one. <laughs> That's good. Well, I, now, uh, we haven't talked much about Anglican news. I thought I saw you post a story about something that happened here in Canada. Let me pull it up. Uh, there was a consecration in Canada that seemed to be outside the norm of what I expected either within the Anglican Church in Canada or our uh, Anglican Church A and C A people in Canada. What's going on there? Uh, well, this is a... Kevin, we're going to make some enemies now. <laughs> oh, no. Again. Well, we're going to make some more enemies. Let, us, let's, let me uh, be fair and honest. Uh -huh. The Anglican mission in Canada, which is a part of the larger Anglican mission. It used to be called the AMIA. Mm -hmm. The AMIA imploded a few years ago. Most of the people formed went into Pair USA uh, under Bishop uh, Breedlove. Uh, yeah. Breedlove, sure. I'm sorry. Yeah. And are now a diocese within the ACNA, and they're doing just great and fine. A small, small group uh, stayed out. And the group that's in Canada is called the Anglican Mission in Canada, AMIC. They had another bishop consecrated for missionary work in Western Canada. That's nice. That's great. Why would we care about it? Well, they had the three Congolese Anglican bishops take part, including the primate. And the primate didn't clear this with the Gafcon Primates Council. Because the Gafcon Primates Council basically have said, "Stop! We're not doing, we're not doing this anymore," because the A A C N A Anglican Church in North America, of which <laughs> the Anglican acronym Net trouble there, <laughs> of which the Anglican Network in Canada is the official franchise of right. faithful evangelical Anglicans in Canada, we're not going to form and support more splinter groups. And what's happened is that, and I, this is the thing that will upset people, you know, there's some African churches that follow the money. And, uh, you know, if you give them the first class tickets and you promise this and that, and you say, oh, we just love you, you can get a, you can get a bishop to do what you want. That's true. And right. I, I think right. we've got another example. Now, there's nothing wrong with, you know, uh, I'm, I'm sure the man who was consecrated a bishop was a wonderful, decent man, and I wish him all God's blessings in his ministry, but there's no reason for him to be a bishop. There's no reason for him to be an Anglican bishop. Uh, you know, uh, it, it's just, I, I think, I think was, I, I do this work. I, I agree with you. I think the Anglican communion needs a lot less mavericks uh, and a lot more Orthodox people who are willing to uh, uh, follow the form and function of Anglicanism. Now, part of the part of my now, I have th these are my personal opinions. And uh oh, sorry. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, uh, the ANEC bishop Charlie Masters is probably one of the best bishops in the ACNA. ACNA has got a good bench of bishops. They do, it's especially a, compared to the Episcopal Church. It, it's uh, all first string. I mean, there's no second string in the ACNA. They're all first string. Well, there are one or two people that I would trade for another graphic, <laughs> but Charlie Masters is first rate, yep. and the environment in Canada is much different than the United States. Sure. It's a very difficult church planning environment. Canada is a, is a, is a generation further down the post-Christian road. And to further subdivide the faithful into more groups, more sects, more splits, I think is a mistake when you've got somebody who is totally on board and on side in Charlie Masters. Why? Why sabotage his work? I don't know. I don't see the point. For well, I do know two or three people uh, in the old Anglican way whose you know, goal every morning when they wake up is to uh, make sure the ACNA does not succeed. They're not pro-tech. 
um, and I'm not going to name names, but uh, they wake up and because uh, their guy didn't win uh, and is not in any leadership any anywhere, f- shape or form, they're working against the ACNA. And mm-hmm. it's, it's what gets them going. Uh, someday we'll do a report on that, but uh, uh, not now. Uh, we just covered all the the things that are wrong with the uh, the secular world. We don't need to deal with the anchor world right now. George, well, no, I, 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 I want to keep scratching this itch, Kevin. I really do. okay. All right, well, we're up to twenty minutes right about now. People are going to keep listening. Keep listening. What's up? Keep listening. Okay, let's start slandering people. It's the only way to keep them on. Let's take it. Let's. Uh, would you like me to stand outside in a ditch and mm-hmm. me and Emerson Cooper can uh, do the Cooper? Uh, <laughs> do the Coop. Do th- <laughs> there are people wish ill of the ACNA, mm-hmm. uh, both on the right and the left. Now, I have to tell you, the Episcopal Church doesn't care about the ACNA. That's its past history. They're not the enemy anymore. Okay. Um, those but people the, it, jumped. it's not like they're stopping the lawsuits and it's not like they're Those, stopping kevin, fighting for property but kevin it, kevin when you talk about lawyers and you talk about new york and sure. you talk about the lawyers who make the decision to pay the lawyers it's a self-perpetuating thing until the money runs out but presiding but the, bishop michael curry doesn't wake up every morning and go oh no what did the acna do today i agree right, he doesn't he doesn't think that and nor do uh we have a mild opposition in the communion partners bishops. Mm-hmm. They are, they're not the future, but that's all there is. Yep. Um, they don't have to worry about the ACNA either. Each is, each, all the concerns at this stage are propy and local. Yet there are people who seek ill for the ACNA. And it's as exact, and uh, here's, here's the controversial thing I'm going to say. There's no theological merit in their arguments. Uh, they would say that it is. They would say that they're not purists on the women issue. They're not That's purists yeah. on the uh, charismatic issue or the sacraments or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And the same people, the atomization that you saw after the uh, Conference of St. Louis in the late 70s, where the Anglican opposition fragmented into a million little popes, they want to repeat that with the ACNA. Sure. And I... Uh, I wish the Episcopal, you know, the Episcopal, Episcopal Church is doing really well in certain spots, and the ACNA is doing really well in certain spots. And I wish everybody who is able to bring the gospel and bring souls to Christ and convert people, God bless them. I don't really care what union you belong to. What I do care about is those who seek to destroy for reasons that are less than godly. And you get that these days. Yeah, you do. You, you get that, and. Sometimes it's hard to tell the difference between the loony left in the Episcopal Church and the loony right in the ACNA in their tactics and their mindset. Well, I mean, we've always there, seen There, Kevin, it. have I slandered enough people? No, well, that- what you did is you led us into the grass is always greener over there. Um, mm-hmm. When we have these discussions about holy orders, when we have these discussions about uh, if, if in affinity diocese and other stuff like that, there are places where the grass looks greener but only visually once you get there you find all the problems i remember i had a a friend in the mid 90s who went orthodox he uh, he had just finished seminary he just finished at virginia tech or virginia theological seminary and within a year he's he's he joined the orthodox church kevin the the theology here is better They, they don't have any problems whatsoever a year later he's got Okay, I was wrong. They just hide it better. <laughs> like, yeah. They hide <laughs> There's it your better. difference. Look, they hide it better. <laughs> I don't see... In other words, the ordinary within the Anglican world was very lucky in its timing. Mm-hmm. Because if the, the ordinary was happening, the formation was happening now, there would be no ordinary. No, absolutely. Because the, cat, because the warts within the Catholic Church are being exposed in tremendous fashion. And the warts in the Orthodox Church uh, are being exposed. And, you know, people ask me, well, why don't you leave this and that? Well, God called me to serve this particular patch of the world, 
and I see his hand at work in our ministries. Yeah. And you for me to switch flags, yeah. Yeah. you know, I don't get a dime from the diocese. I don't get a dime from the national church. Um, yeah. The only benefit for me is uh, a future pension. For, for no, I'm, 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 for I'm banking on great. No, I'm, I'm well. I'm going to. Uh, you know, I'll I'll drop dead at seventy two when the pension kicks in. But and basically, we're we're counting on Uncle Clarence, great Uncle Clarence, to take care sure. of those things. But uh, you know, the the Episcopal Church. Uh, some people have argued that the Spirit God has withdrawn the Holy Spirit from the Episcopal Church, and they can point to certain things happening. And I say, yes, that looks like the Spirit's withdrawn. But then I look at all these other places, and I look. And I look at this recent stuff up in Canada, and you can't tell me that it's just the spirit has just been withdrawn in one little corner. It seems it's withdrawing everywhere. From and our problems are is nothing compared. We've did some reports on the church in China, Kevin, mm -hmm. where the Catholic Church now has decided to get in bed with the communists, allow the commun the. We printed on Anglican ink. I had it translated by a parishioner who's Chinese. The formal statement by the Chinese Catholic Patriotic, Patriotic Association after they signed the Concordat with Rome, and where they said their first loyalty is to is it to Jesus Christ? No. Nope. Is it to the, the Vatican and the Pope? No. Is nope. the Magister? Nope. It's to the Communist Party of China. And the Vatican has allowed that group now to run the Catholic Church in China. So we may think we've got grief, but we've got nothing compared to being a faithful Catholic priest in China yeah. or some of these other places. It's not been a bright day. I mean, it's not been a bright month, season, year for the Roman Catholic Church or the, or the church as a whole. Uh, something to keep in your prayers. Something that obviously we'll be talking about in future episodes. George, we've hit 27 minutes. We're going to have mercy on our audience. But first, audience participation time. If you've liked the episode, click the like button on YouTube or Facebook. If you didn't like the episode, share it with your friends and say, I did not like this episode, watch it and find out why I didn't like it. If you have not subscribed yet and you're not getting regular updates when we publish, click the red subscribe button. Um, if you have a little extra cash at the end of the month and you want to help with this ministry, uh, go to Anglican. Kevin does have a son going off to college next year. Oh we need to start socking it away. Go to anglican.inc forward slash donate and uh, uh, send a little uh, help our way. Uh, no, all proceeds just go to uh, travel and to uh, equipment. But one day maybe I'll make a, a penny off this. this no, no, no. Industry. Usually sometimes we bribe customs officials and guards at airports. <laughs> we do. And then uh, every once in a while I do take George out uh, to dinner or Gavin out to dinner when we're on a, on a travel. And you guys help treat us for that. The extra Diet Coke. We want to thank you for that. That We, we appreciate that. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Congren. You've been watching episode 445 of Anglican on the screen.